Okay, <laughs> sorry for the advertisement. And now I want to go from the basics and uh, eventually we will understand what a quantum computer is about. So quantum computing, in summary, I will say that it used two important phenomena, superposition and entanglement. We use quantum mechanics in transistor already. That's why we have band, band structure, uh, uh, electron hole, uh, conduction, etc. But quantum computing, it used two important phenomena, superposition and entanglement, which we will discuss later. And one more important thing is, I want to emphasize interference is very important because without interference, most of the time we cannot get the answer that we want. You will see that later. There are two types of major uh, quantum computing uh, architecture, or, or I mean, a uh, uh, paradigm. One is the gate base that we will talk in this talk. It just like uh, the gate circuit. We have a classical logic, but not exactly the same. However, we can think uh, 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 in this way for now, right? You have a state and you keep processing by using different gates. Another is quantum annealing. This is basically like to solve some optimization problem. You form an energy landscape by using the quantum hardware or qubit, and hopefully you can find the minimum energy quickly, uh, much faster than the classical one because it allows some quantum tunneling in the hyperspace or the configuration space that they have. And uh, this is something, for example, the D-Wave uh, has been doing, right? And we heard about very many uh, good things about quantum computing. Yes, if it works, you can help you to design battery, design the drug, even do computational dynamics. Yeah, it provides secure communication. We can use it for quantum machine learning or financial service and predictions. So its economical in impact is going to be enormous if it is successful. So why is quantum computing? I would say, um, let's look at the classical computing first. We use zero and one to represent the information. How do we represent zero and one? You can use the coin, head and tail, or even happy and sad, a transistor on and off, right? So we, it represents the information uh, by the state. Actually, it is the same in quantum computing. There's, but it has something more basic called basis state. It's just like the X, Y, X hat, Y hat, and Z hat on our 3D space. So using the same token, I can represent the inform the basis state maybe by uh, head and tail, happy and sad, transistor being on and off. And there's no difference between quantum computing and classical computing. If you limit the quantum computer to only operate on its basis state, Particularly here, I put a so-called bracket notation. It is nothing but just a notation. So just accept it, right? So I represent a state by putting it in this bracket. What's so special about quantum computing is that it also works on superposition. It means that besides the basic state, I can also have a state which is a linear combination of the basic state. For example, a state psi can be a linear combination of zero and one, where zero and one are just the basis state. And to describe this state, for this so-called one qubit, I need two complex number, alpha and beta. Some people would like to make an analogy like this. The superposition is just like a coin that is spinning on your table. You still don't know whether it's head and tail. And it's a superposition of head and tail. Of course, this is just an analogy. You cannot build a quantum computing by using some spinning coins, right? So what's so important is this. On the left, I'm showing you that in a classical register, uh, I, let's say in this example, I have four bits. These four bits can represent 16 possible states. And these are just the basic states in a quantum computer. So I can, if I have four qubits, I can represent 16 basic states. So nothing special. But if I have four qubits, I can also represent the states of the linear combination of this 16 basis state. That means I need 16 uh, complex number to describe one of the states in this quantum computer register. Now, what if I have n qubits? If I have n qubits, then I have two to the power n basis state. And to describe one state, I need two to the power n complex number. Maybe a lot of math, but the point 
I'm trying to point out is that there's a lot of information in the superposition. Think about that. If I have 300 electrons, then it means I have 2 to the power 300 basis state in order to describe these 300 electrons. Then I need to, need to have 10 to the power 90 complex coefficient to describe it. Just to describe one of the states of these 300 electrons, I would not be able to save it in any of the storage we have in this world. There are only less than 10 to the power 82 atoms in the universe. If we can encode one complex number in one atom, we cannot even encode the states of 300 electrons by using all the atoms in the universe. Needless to say, to store in all the uh, storage that we have in the world. So this one did not tell you, tell you much, but at least it tell you that the quantum mechanics is very enormous. By just having 300 electrons, it contains a lot of information. That is the power of superposition. Well, then what can we do with that? Well, we, in principle, uh, we, quantum mechanics is linear. So you apply a function to a superposition, it will be applied to each of these basis states uh, simultaneously, right? This is kind of a hand-waving argument, but looks like correct. It's just like I have a parallel universe. I have many parallel universe. Each of them try to compute the function for me for each uh, basis state. If this work, that will achieve a very important quantum parallelism, okay? So we see its power. Then one important thing about quantum, uh, quantum computing is how we do the measurement. I told you that a superposition state is just like a spinning coin. How will you me measure the coin? Well, I will just stop it, right? What will happen? It may either collapse to head or it can collapse to tail. That is the same for a quantum uh, superposition state. If it is alpha zero plus beta one, if I do a measurement, it may collapse to zero or collapse to one. So this is completely random. The only thing that's not completely random is that the probability that it will collapse to zero depends on the square of the magnitude of the coefficient, like alpha square in front of for zero and beta square for one. So you see that even I have a lot of information stored in a quantum state, I am not able to get what they are. I need to do a lot of measurement and only to know that what their magnitudes or their relative magnitudes are, right? So this is one limitation of quantum mechanics, but we will discuss this later. So we talk about superposition. We see it is powerful. We can do quantum parallelism but it's limited by the measurement. We need to deal with that. Another important thing about quantum uh, computing is the entangled state. Now, just now I told you that if you have one qubit, you have two basis states, zero and one. If you have two qubit, you can have zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one. Just like the four qubit case, you can have zero all the way to 15. Now here I'm showing you a two qubit state which form as a superposition of its basis states, right? So it's, al it's alpha, beta, gamma, or its co coefficient here are half, negative half, half, negative half. For this two qubit state that may come from two electrons, I can so do a so-called tensor product to factorize it into two states. So basically what it is talking about is that I can describe this whole system by describing the individual system separately and then combine them. So they are unentangled. Just like before my wife and I marry, I, uh, we, are, we can describe ourselves separately. And then as a two people, we are not coupling to each other, right? Now, if you have, a, there are some states, you can never factorize it so that it becomes the tensor product of two systems. In order to describe this system, you cannot describe it from the subsystem. You need to describe this as a whole. This is called entangled state. They are coupled. So this is a very important property in quantum computing. And let's take a look at some, some special 
implication. For example, if I create two electrons, I entangle them. I make them in an entangled state. In this particular case, it is spin up, spin up, and spin down, spin down. I told you earlier, this is bracket notation. It's nothing but just a notation. Inside it, I can put anything. So this can also be described as 0, 0 plus 1, 1. Or in English, spin up, up, spin down, down. It's all up to you, right? But we know that it represents the basis state of this whole system, which is 0, 0, and 1, 1. Now, I do it very carefully and move one of the electrons to 109 years away so that they are still entangled, right? Unless they got in, uh, disrupt, disrupt, disrupted by some external environment, you can imagine they are still entangled, right? Now, what happens if I do a measurement on the electron on Earth? Now, based on this combination, you see that it can, it will collapse to either spin up or spin down. That's what we just said, eh? said earlier, right? Any superposition state will collapse to the basis state. So for the uh, electron on the Earth, you will collapse to be up or down with 50% because of the coefficient. So let's say I get up. Now, if I get it collapsed to up, what will happen to the another electron 109 years away? In this whole system, when my electron it only has two basis state that has non-zero coefficient. So the whole system needs to collapse to up, up, or down, down. It doesn't have up, down. So if my electron on the Earth collapse to up, the electron very far away must collapse to up also. So this becomes something called spooky action for Albert Einstein. He said, how the electron 109 years away know what happened to the electron in Earth instantaneously? Are they transmitting some information faster to the, than the speed of light? We won't go into the details. It won't, right? But this is uh, just to show you the power or the special of the specialty of this uh, quantum entanglement. But I just want you to remember something called quantum entang entanglement that these two uh, states are highly correlated. Okay, so we look over the basics of the, or the most important thing about quantum computing, again, superposition and entanglement and measurement, right? So what is a quantum gate then? Quantum gate is nothing but just rotates the weather in its hyperspace. Again, every quantum qubit or a group of qubit or a register, they are just a state, right? And this state is a linear combination of the basis state. When you apply a gate to it, you rotate it in the hyperspace, not in the space we live in, but in a hyperspace, mathematical hyperspace. And people like to map it to something called broad sphere when it is one qubit. We won't go into detail, but this broad sphere is something sometimes pretty useful, but sometimes can be confusing. But anyway, for example, when you have a zero state for this qubit, you apply a gate, you can rotate to any part on this broad sphere and it becomes a new state. How do we rotate it? Very often, a gate is just a laser or microwave pulse. It's not the knot gate or a LAN gate we lay out on a semiconductor chip, right? We will discuss more later about that, but remember this. There are different types of gates. Some of them has class classical counterpart. For example, the NOT gate. The NOT say what it does is just change the basis states from 0 to 1 and 1 to 0. It also has two qubit, two qubit gate. For example, a control NOT gate. So what does it do? It is going to change the second qubit, or what we call the target qubit, from 0 to 1 or 1 to 0. That means apply a NOT gate to it if the first qubit or the control qubit is 1. If the first qubit is zero, then it's go not going to do anything to the second qubit. Okay, but we can build this on a classical computer. So nothing special, as I told you before. Quantum computing is the same as classical computing. Is you need if you limit them to only operate on the basis state. If you don't allow them to do work on superposition, it's not going to be useful. But it has some gates that has no classical counterparts. For example, a Hadamard gate. I have a basis state start from zero. After I apply the Hadamard gate, it becomes a superposition of zero and one. 
In classical computer, if you have a register, I ask you what is the uh, content you say is zero or one five. If you say zero plus one, we know that this is an error. It must be an error, right? But we can do this in quantum computer. So let's take a look at the control knot gate or exclusive of gate. This is a very important gate to do the entanglement. There are some so-called universal sets of uh, uh, quantum gates. A group of one qubit gates, which is easy to imp implement, and then a few of the entanglement gates. And one of the important one is the c not gate. If you have the c not gates, two qubit gates, plus this one qubit gates, you basically can build any algorithm from scratch. So let's take a look what I said earlier. I said that you have two qubit one of them is control qubit, the second is target qubit. When the control qubit is zero, you do nothing to the second qubit. You see that? So it is still zero, 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 one. But if your control qubit is one, you negate the second qubit. So one zero becomes one, 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 one becomes one zero. And here shows a circuit that we usually draw. We won't go into details, but I want to uh, remind you that in the future, when we read any papers or test book, make sure that what they mean by the most significant bits and least significant bits in their circuit. In this particular case, I put the most significant bits on top. So top is the control qubit, the bottom is the target qubit. Because of this, its effect on a general two qubit state, right? Because I have four basis states, right? And four coefficient, right? Is to swap the coefficient of these two basis states. Okay. Let's take an example, look at an example, how it does the entanglement. I can start with the ground state. So I have zero, zero. I go for a hard armor gate. Remember, I just told you hard armor gate is the one that can create superposition. So zero, and I only apply to qubit A, the most significant bit, right? So B doesn't change, but the A becomes a superposition of it. And then just like what we do the, in uh, elementary school, do this distribution law, this is called tensor product. We don't go into the, the detail, but they have this, they share the same math. Then you get zero, zero and one, zero. See so the superposition of two basis state of this whole system, right? Remember what is the basis state of this whole system? is two qubits, so we have zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one. In this case, it only has zero, zero, and one, zero uh, component. And then I apply a control not gate. Control not gate say that if the first qubit is zero, do nothing. So zero, zero is still zero, zero. If the first qubit is one, negate the second qubit, then I get one, one. And this is the entanglement states I showed you earlier in the spooky action uh, slide, right? Spin up, up, spin down, down. So up to here, I show you the basics of some qubit and the entanglement gate. And now let's go up to a higher level to understand what quantum gates and circuits are about. One imp uh, important property is that quantum gates are reversible. For example, in the classical computing, I give you the gate type and also the output. You don't know what the input is because 0, 0, 0, 1 and 1, 1, 0, 4 and 9 gates, but all give me 1, 1 as the output. So it's not reversible. But quantum gates must be reversible as you can see here. And that is just because of the physics of quantum mechanics. I told you earlier what is a quantum gate. It is just a laser pulse, a microwave pulse. You apply to a qubit, you change its state, so this is follow the Schrodinger equation. So you rotate it in the hyperspace so you can rotate in one di direction, you should be able to reverse it in another direction. So here shows usually what we see a layout of a quantum circuit. And now I want to tell you what is difference from the classical circuit. I start with a state. This is a state later I will show you in a qubit, for example, a transmon qubit. We apply a gate, it means we apply a microwave pulse. It doesn't go through a gate, neither like LAN gate nor gate on our IC layout. We apply a pulse to it, it rotates its state. Apply another gate means another pulse, rotate its state again. We apply M pulse and then do measurement. 
In this process, they are reversible, as I said, right? You apply a pulse to rotate to that direction. I can re apply another pulse to rotate it to another direction in their hyperspace, not in our 3D space. And, but after we do the measurement, we cannot go back. Now, do, do you see that this is the flow of time, not a space? So in some algorithm you see in the future, they say that you need to apply one billion of gates. You will get very nervous if you are an IC layout designer. Well, I need to apply one billion gates. That is impossible or difficult in an IC chip, right? In a train. But here just means that you keep applying the same microwave, I mean, different microwave pulse 100 times, 1 million times or 1 billion times. Okay. The last topic of the part one, what I talk about, what I talk about is about error correction. Now, in classical computer, usually we will do duplication to avoid to avoid the error, right? I call my mom in Asia and I say something to her she cannot hear. I keep repeating 100 times. At least maybe 50 times she heard that. Then she get that as the answer. But in quantum computing, it doesn't work because there's something called no cooling theorem. You cannot copy an arbitrary state, okay? So then what can we do? Uh, one of the method is called so-called syndrome measurement. Just like, I, like some uh, medicine or traditional medicine, like they don't re really test what you have, they look at the syndrome, right? If I'm coughing, I don't know if I got COVID or just regular flu, I went to the doctor. One possibility, instead of testing my blood uh, uh, or my saliva, maybe the doctor is so experienced, say, how often does you cough? Uh, what, how, what's your fever? He, hearing to my heartbeat, heartbeat. And then maybe the doctor came up with a conclusion, oh, you just have a regular flu. That is what we do in quantum computer also for error correction. Psi is a state that I'm care, I care about. What I do is apply some C naught gate to two entanglement to, to some auxiliary qubit. And then maybe I got some error. This is just a gate to mimic the error. Through this, I can just measure this gate and then do appropriate operation to Psi based on my measurement open, outcome. So here, not just that we have measurement, this circuit is just that you do the automatic correction. Let's take look. Take a look and uh, on an example. Again, I said the side is what I care about, and then I it is in terms of alpha zero plus beta one. I don't know what is alpha. I don't know what is beta, right? Again, this is one qubit, right? Because I have two basis states zero and one and two coefficient. So what I do is combine with this auxiliary qubit starting with zero. So what is the uh, basis state of this whole system? Because this is two are zero, so I only have zero, 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 and one, zero, zero, right? I have three qubits, I have eight basis state, remember? Zero, 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 one, zero, zero, one, zero, all the way to one, 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 right? But because this is zero, so the whole system combined with sign is just zero, 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 and one, zero, zero. Then I go through the first control not gate and the second control not gate. Again, control not gate says that if this is one, negate it. If this is one, negate it. For the first, first basis state, this is zero, nothing change. For the second one, this is one, right? So I change zero, zero to one, one. So you see it's entangled. That's why we say this is a process of entanglement, which is very important. Let's say I'm very unlucky. I got the first bit flip. It was one, zero, zero one, now becomes one, zero. It's flip, right? So this circuit will save me. Why? Now, I have another control not gate. It says that if this is one, flip it, negate it. If this is one, negate this one. So look at this. This is one, right? Because it got flipped. So it's going to negate zero and zero. So I got one, one, one. The second one is zero here. Then I'm not going to do anything because it's the property of control not. So I still get zero, one, one, right? So with this, then what happened at the, at the end? How do I correct? With this circuit, this is an, a so-called control control knot we did not discuss. It means that I'm going to negate this bit if both of these are one. Now look at this, both of these are one. So I mean here, both are one. So I'm going to change back to zero. Both of one, I change this to one. 
And you see that through this operation, I recover psi equal to alpha zero plus beta one because I don't care of this auxiliary bit. So in quantum computing, where algorithm very often you will see the so-called auxiliary bit uh, that or, or, or ancillary bit. They're critical for the operation, but the, you discard them at the end. Okay, try different type of fit uh, flipping, right? They can also flip your auxiliary bit. You will find that you can correct that. Okay, uh, at this moment, I would like to just show quickly an algorithm which is called uh, Deutsch algorithm. And uh, just so that you have an idea on what, what it is about, right? So Deutsch algorithm is, a, is something that help you to answer a question. I have a function, a black box. Right, this black box actually can be very complicated. For example, I always think from IC perspective, does this circuit pass the timing uh, criteria? Right, when you take our IC, one 10 billion transistor or 1 billion transistor, do you meet the timing criteria? This is yes and no question. But to answer this question is super difficult, right? So here is a simple question, very simple. Just, uh, I mean, uh, a simple example. It only take one bit, zero and one, and output zero and one. I want to ask whether this function is constant or it is balanced. Constant means, means whatever I put in, it gives me the same output. For example, constantly zero or constantly one. Balance means that whatever I put in, it always give me, um, not whatever, but uh, for all the vector I put in, it always it will give me half zero and half one as the output, and that is called balance. Now, in classical computing, if you don't know what the function is, what do you need to do? For this simple question, you need at least two computation, right? Okay, I have uh, some video for this. You can which is out in the video that I showed you earlier, right? You need at least two computation. But for quantum computing, I only need one computation by utilizing the uh, quantum parallelism, okay? And the way we do it is to encode the problem into something called quantum oracle, uh, which is uh, the one of the most difficult problem because very, very often people come up with a quantum uh, algorithm. The problem is difficult to implement the quantum oracle. Let's say we can implement, but a quantum oracle, again, is just like a huge quantum gate. It's a gate, a complicated gate, but it still just tell me when I have input x, y, x, y can be zero and one, what the output will be. You see the output is that x is going to keep constant, just like a control not gate, but the output, the second qubits, the target qubits will become y exclusive f of x. So you see that the information of f is encoded in the quantum oracle. But what is f of x? You also see that this oracle cannot tell you because it only uh, gives you y exclusive f of x, not f of x. So we actually are missing some information in order to get the, this answer. The overall result is that I can find out whether it is balanced or constant much faster by only using one computation. And it's the same if it turns out that we have many qubits, also only one computation. But I don't know what the function is. I don't know when I input zero, it is going to give me zero or one, okay? So this is the overflow of the, the flow of the algorithm. Again, uh, this you, you don't know this if you did not study before. I just want to show you, let you appreciate how people uh, construct the algorithm and what are the critical parts on an algorithm. And most of the algorithm are pretty similar. First, you need to have the quantum oracle. As I just told you, you need to encode this f of x into the oracle so that it has this relationship. There are other types of oracle, of course. Another thing is I'm going to prepare this in a superposition. I hope you ring the bell. I prepare it in superposition because I want to do quantum parallelism. I want to have all these states at the same time. And then I apply to this oracle, then it will compute at the same time. 
Now, as I told you earlier, I cannot get the coefficient fast, right? Because I need to do measurement many times just to know its relative magnitude. So I need to do some special operation, which basically is just constructive and destructive interference. So that in this case, it always gives me zero at the output if the function is constant. And it always gives me one if the fun function is balanced. Okay, and that is how Dodge algorithm is constructed. Okay, so let me do a quick live demo. I, I don't want to uh, waste you. Can you see my screen? Uh, yes, we can okay. still see it. Yeah, so it's called IBM Q. I just I already have my account, right? It has two things. One is called Lab Composer, one is called Launch uh, Lab. Right, composer is the GUI interface. It's uh, simpler, so we'll do this. The lab, uh, you can use the Python programming to run it. Okay, so I come to here. Uh, this is you see the interface. You see, uh, probably you already see some of the gate already, right? That you can recognize some of them, right? And I need to uh, take a look at my cheat sheet, right? So just uh, I'm going to have two qubits. So maybe what I'm going to do is just right click, uh, no, maybe uh, just click left click, delete those that I don't want, right? And then I'm going to uh, apply uh, not gate to this and an identity identity gate. Identity gate means I'm not doing anything. Not gate just makes zero to one and one to zero. And after that, I put two Hadama gate. The reason is that I want to create a superposition. I add this uh, breaker just to make it nice. This has no uh, function. And after that, after that, I need to put the quantum oracle. Now here I put a very simple quantum oracle, which is just corresponds to the a, a constant function when all the output are zero, right? So I don't go into detail to prove that this uh, fulfill that, but this is just for a simulation purpose. Uh, demonstration purpose. In reality, of course, you don't know what the co or, uh, it's difficult to construct the oracle, right? Uh, it can take a lot of time to construct. Then your algorithm won't be useful. Then I apply a Hadama gaze, as I say, to do the uh, interference, and then eventually I will do a measurement. Right. So uh, I'm not showing the slide, but as I said earlier, if this is a constant function then I expect the output to be always zero, okay? Now here it has four classical register. This is just a register to store your output. So originally it has four qubit, that's why it has four. So I'm going to, uh, reduce, this to reduce it to two because I only have two register, right? And then what do I do? I will just uh, submit the, sorry. I will just, uh, here, go here, set up and run. Now it does have many uh, real quantum computer, but nowadays it takes a long time. Sometimes take one or two hours, even longer. So I will just submit to a simulator. This is basically just a, a emulator using classical computer, right? So I just click on this and then I submit the job. So uh, it may take some time. I don't know uh, what will happen. So maybe I will uh, just, show you uh, what I had, sorry, set up and run, right? Okay, it has new job result already. This is fast, right? Just so I click on this. It takes some time to load. Just bear with me. If it doesn't work in 30 seconds, then I will open my old result. Okay, so it has the results. I do want to show you something uh, so you have a better understanding about the quantum computer. Uh, let me see. Oh, okay. Yeah, anyway, I will show you later and, and, and in another example because this is simulation. I can you sh cannot show you that now. This is the measurement outcome. You see, it is all zero, right? Then we know that this function is balanced. Actually, what I want to show you is the job that, 
I ran with the real quantum computer. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot find it. But basically, what I want to tell you is that they will go, it will go through a compilation process. So what you are doing here is just a gate, but then you will further compile it to something with higher uh, fidelity so that it uh, a more primitive gate, or you can say more primitive gate, so that you have a higher fidelity. Okay, so uh, I will stop here and go back. Can you see it? Uh, now I'm on the presentation mode. What did we learn? Can you see it? Yes, okay. I, I can see the slides. Thank you. Yeah, so basically I already said what we have said. Right? Uh, we're encoding the quantum oracle, uh, but this is uh, information, uh, something I want to say. Quantum computer is not really something very uh, unbelievable. Right? In this example, we see that, yeah, I can get the answer quick, but it doesn't mean that I get all the answer I want. It is, I, I feel that it has something like conservation of information for the time you can spend. What we are doing, just we give up the details of the function so that we know that which is zero and one, right? So I feel that it just show us another path to find the answer. But this is just a hand waving. Maybe the mathematician can prove that I'm wrong. They really have a real proof that saying that the information we can get from there is much more than the uh, classical computer. But the most important thing, I do want you to understand there's a trade off of the information. Okay. So uh, I'm done with this. Uh, Let's go on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have learned the basics. The algorithm looks very fancy, right? If that would they work, but uh, how do we implement in hardware? There are many different hardware. So uh, first, we look at this uh, divisional criteria. What hardware can be used uh, to make a quantum computer? First, you need to have a well characterized qubit. Basically, what it's saying is that your qubit need to have two basis states, zero and one. Do not give me more. Because all the physical, physical system, they can have multiple qubits. They can have zero, one, two, three, four, five, different states. If that happens, you are operating in a higher dimension, higher, uh, more uh, profound qubit space, and you leak the information to another space, right? Then it won't work. Of course, you can say you formalize your quantum computer to work on four levels. That is also okay. Just like classical semiconductor, you or logic right now we're zero and one we do have multi-level logic like even the uh fresh memory they have three that one uh they can store zero to seven eight states or even more for one bit right so but if we say that only zero and one then you better have a system that won't lead to higher states that because that will cause error you need to be able to initialize them quickly if you just take a look at the algorithm i just showed you we all in, we initialize it to uh, zero, uh, for example, uh, zero at the beginning. And that is the best way to start the quantum algorithm. Okay, And uh, so you should be able to initialize it. If your system is going to take one minute to initialize a qubit, it's not going to work because there are many algorithms uh, you w want to initialize it very frequently and many times. And also, uh, for like last time we say, we need to run many times to get the answer. So you need to run it um, initial size many times, and then you will have a problem, right? Long coherence times. When you are at zero, you better stay at zero. At one, stay at one. Do not change to other state before I finish the computation. So you want to have a co coherence times longer than the gate time, right? You definitely see should be able to do one cubic gates and entanglement gates with this then you can do most of the algorithms another thing is that you should be allow, allow them to measure individual qubit sometimes the whole system need to be measured then it won't be useful just like the 
uh, spooky action I just mentioned to you, I measure the QB on the Earth. If your system need to measure every QB at the same time, it won't work. For example, something called quantum teleportation will not work if you need to measure them all at, the, at, at once. If you want to use quantum communication, you also do, need to make sure that the QB is flying, so need to be able to interact with the stationary qubit. And also, uh, when you are flying, you need to be uh, keep the coherence, right? But we are only talking about quantum computer here. So how do we implement the qubit? Well, as a joke, I can it can be a superposition of happy and sad. You ask me, uh, how's my mood today? I may say, all oh, kind of happy, kind of sad, right? But not reliable. Uh, in reality, what we can do is how about spin qubit? It can be spin up, spin down. Then they have two different energy level in this quantum dot. And then you can form a superposition of this two qubit. You can also use photonic. This is uh, just a wave guy and I did not draw it. You shoot a, a photon, one single photon, and they are symmetric. So where is the photon? In quantum mechanics, it is a superposition of these two paths. It can on the top and the bottom path. That is the superposition. But when you measure it, you can either only find it either here or here. You cannot find it both, right? Because I only have one photon. That is the collapse of the wave function. The one that we are going to talk about is the superconducting charge qubit. This is something called Josephson Junction. Josephson Junction is just like an LC tank. If I add a capacitor, in large enough capacitor, it also has its parasitic capacitor. It's just like an LC tank but it has nonlinear inductance. Because it's nonlinear, that solves the problem of equal spacing of different levels in a simple harmonic oscillator. I just told you that to be a quantum computer, you need to confine it between zero and one state. You cannot lead to second state. So if we have different spacings, then we can confine it in zero and one. And what it does is this, it has a capacitor here. This form an island. In this island, you can have zero or one extra pair of Cooper pairs. Cooper pairs is a pair of electrons that occurs at superconducting state, right? We don't need to go into their details, but it's just a pair of electrons. They work together. So treat it as a new particle. So I have one extra or zero extra uh, particle here that represents a qubit. And of course, it can be a superposition because it's quantum mechanics. I have a linear combination of zero extra and one extra Cooper pair. Okay. Now, both, no matter what you use to implement, maybe not for photonics, they only have very small energy difference between the zero and one state. And because they interact with the outside world, they can lose their state due to coherent decoherence. On the right, I'm showing you the scale of uh, energy scale as a function of temperature. For example, at 300 Kelvin, it's about 26 millivolts of thermal energy. We can cool it down by liquid helium to 4 Kelvin, but a qubit separation is only in the order of uh, what? 0 0.02 mini Kelvin, very small, is equivalent to 0 0.3, so sorry, uh, I say the wrong thing. The energy is 0 0.02 milli EV, right? Correspond to 0 0.23 Kelvin. In order to make it work, we need to cool it down so that the environment is cool enough. For example, in direction refrigerator, in the order of 10 mini Kelvin, then you have the thermal energy at least 10 times less than the qubit separation so that you won't be affected by the thermal energy so you have a longer coherence time. You can use direction refrigerator, DR, or laser cooling, for example, in the trap iron. So why is the coherence? For example, I may be in the one state and I keep I try to wait for different time. So here I did, this is a real quantum, superconducting quantum computer experiment in, we did in Livermore National lab. The, when you 
wait for a long time, when you measure it again, you say that it starts decaying to zero. The probability of finding one becomes less and less. This is so-called T1 coherence time, only in the order of 219 microseconds. So you can imagine your gates need to operate way faster than that, maybe uh, 0.5 microsecond, so that you can have enough operation before it decays. Okay? Another thing is the so-called T2 de decoherence time. It is saying that I start with a superposition. It is still in superposition, but it loses the phase gradually. Usually, it is much shorter than the T1 time. As, as this is oscillation, uh, I can I won't I don't want have time to go into detail. But that is the way to measure the T2. We bring it to the superposition and then rotate it back to non-superposition and measure the zero and one states. It will oscillate. But anyway, the envelope determine is the coherence time, right? So you need to be less than T2 because T1 and T2 are all there at the same time. So you need to be much less than T2 for your qubit to work. So I just told you, uh, we can actually use the LC tank to make a qubit, right? If you do some quantization, right, circuit quantization, you will find that it behaves like a simple harmonic oscillator. You have zero extra electron, one extra electron, two extra, uh, sorry, photon. Zero extra photon, one extra photon, two extra photon. Uh, you may feel surprising why you're talking a photon. Remember electromagnetic wave. Uh, photons are electromagnetic wave. That's why we call it photon, right? So everything is governed by Maxwell equation. So zero, one, two photon in this LC10. The problem is that they have equal spacing. So we say that lack of enharmonicity. When you have equal spacing, then uh, apply a pulse, you go to one, apply another pulse, you won't go back to zero because you may go to two, then screw up. That's why we use the simple harmonic, uh, use the Josephson junction. Here is something called transmon. We, par uh, we have a parallel capacitor. In this case, you see the energy separation becomes smaller and smaller when you go up. Right? So I can confine them in the zero and one state. Of course, now this is photon. This is like extra Cooper pair for, for this qubit. Right? And here it has two important quantity. One is so-called the EC, the coupling, uh, the capacitor, the uh, capacitive energy here due to this capacitor. Another is Josephson junction energy. And what is that? Do, don't worry about the equation. By showing you this, just want to show a few important concepts. Josephson Junction is a very simple device, a metal, insulator metal, just a capacitor. But because we cool it to very low temperature, it becomes a superconductor, insulator, superconductor. That's it. The special thing about it is that it has a constant current or its current depends on the phase difference across it. We did not discuss this, so I'm sorry if you don't uh, if you don't really get this because it needs a lot of explanation. But there's something called phase for this uh, uh, quantum object for this uh, Cooper pair. They have a phase because they are the uh, wave function. The phase difference determines how much current going through, and the phase will change if you apply a voltage. So basically. Even you have zero voltage, but you have phase different, you get current. You don't have this in a regular resistor, right? And then, and that is because they're superconducting. Even you don't have voltage, you expect a constant current keep going through, okay? So that is the so-called Josephson junction equation. And it has nonlinear inductance. That is what we just said, okay? It depends on the phase. The only message I want you to remember is that its inductance is nonlinear. That's why it makes it a good qubit. It also has the associated energy because it's an inductance, right? Uh, an inductor has energy. A capacitor has energy. So that's why we have this EC, capacitive energy, and also EJ, which we call it Josephson junction energy, but which is nothing but just the inductance energy that it has. Here shows the layout of a transform from this paper. This is the IC layout you look from the top. 
Here, the gray one are just the insulator, the substrate sapphire insulator. The substrate, just something to hold the device. This very tiny thing you cannot see is the Josephson junction. Aluminum, insulator, aluminum. That's it. They form a junction there. That is the whole Josephson junction. Very simple. But they also have a large capacitor in parallel, parallel with it. This is to for this structure. I have Josephson junction, I have a parallel capacitor. Because you want to form something called transmon qubit. A transmon qubit has a large shunt capacitor. For some reason, I will explain later. And this is, this is the, a qubit already. And I said earlier, I don't need to form the gate because I'm going to put the qubit here and then I have a transmission line going all the way to a port. Then how do I apply, uh, operate on this qubit? I apply a gate pulse. Then the state of this Josephson junction, which is a linear combination of zero and one extra Cooper pair will change. The alpha and beta will change. And that is how we uh, operate a qubit. Okay. Now this is the chip, but then how about the whole system? Here shows uh, one of the work we did earlier from this paper. Uh, of course, uh, it's not about this dump, it's about the study of the readout, but here shows the uh, how a quantum computer is made today. It occupies a whole room, super big. Because first you need to have this server from a company called Quantum Machines. You can have it yourself. What it does is keep generating pulse, very high speed pulse. And based on the readouts, it generates other pulse. This microwave pulse will get to the mixer to bring to the right frequency. And they are at 300 Kelvin. Then we will go through attenuator to filter the noise to uh, make the, 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 to reduce the thermal noise. Keep going, 300 Kelvin, 4 Kelvin, 700 mini Kelvin, 10 mini Kelvin. So this is in the direction refrigerator I just mentioned. And here we sit a resonator. This is different from this one. It's a 3D resonator, but you see that it's just the same as this circuit. And inside the resonator, it has a very, very tiny qubit that you cannot see here. That is one of the qubits. The, my, the pulse we shoot in is negative 47 dBm, very small. When you get attenuation and reach the resonator, you only have about 363 photons, right? If you make it smaller, so they are countable. That's why they are very sensitive to noise. So in this setup, we are showing the readout. We shoot the pulse here, and then we try to read the pulse. And you need a quantum amplifier, which add the least noise to it, and then you have different stages of amplifier to see the signal, right? So you see a quantum computer is really nothing but 99% classical electronics, cryogenic electronics, FPGA, high-speed electronics, control theory, error correction, mechanics, and direction refrigerator. And only this part is qubit. Okay, so if you're an electrical engineer, you're an engineer, you should consider to go to this field because without you, quantum computer is not going to work. Okay, so here I want to talk about how we read out the quantum computer. So as an initial introduction, the way we do it is that we shoot the pulse to here. This is a resonator. We were going to detect the pulse. Depends on the resonance frequency. We will have the largest amplitude when the resonance frequency meets our uh, pulse frequency. Okay. But when you have a qubit at zero and one state, it's going to change the resonance frequency of this system. So if it is one, resonance frequency may shift to lower. When it's zero, it may shift to higher. And that is how we read out the qubit of a superconducting qubit. Because of time, uh, I will just quickly go through this line. Uh, don't worry, because it's impossible to understand if you did not study before. But the message I want to tell you is that 
some there's something called cavity quantum electrodynamics. That's what physics people have been doing. They put an atom here in an optical cavity. This atom has two level system, and the optical cavity also can contain one, zero, two, three, four photons, and they interact with each other. That is the so-called Hamiltonian de describing the interaction. But no worry about this. The most important thing is that is saying that you I can create, I can excite the atom to a higher level by absorbing a photon. Or the atom will emit a new photon by going to a lower level. So that is a cavity that allows us to distinguish the level of this atom by shooting a laser pulse to here, right? So although I did not plan to talk about other quantum mechanical architecture, this is one of the possible qubit that you can do. And uh, it's not, uh, similar to trap iron, right? So use the atom as a qubit and use the laser pulse to probe it or to manipulate it. There are two frequencies. One is the cavity resonance frequency. One is the atom transition frequency. And they also have the coupling strength between them, right? When the two frequencies are different, we say there is a detuning. And this is important so that when this atom is at different level, it's going to change the resonant frequency of this cavity overall. If they have different, if there is a detuning, then you are going to have a different change of the uh, of these two level. As a result, when your atom is at zero and one state, your overall frequency will shift. This is a uh, uh, confusing. I know I did not explain well, but this is just to bring you to our superconducting qubit. I just want you to understand that we lay out the chip, we can lay out a resonator. This is the cavity, just like the optical cavity here, two lens here. And it's coupled to a superconducting qubit. This superconducting qubit has two levels, right? One or zero extra Cooper pair. It is just like an artificial atom. So it has two states, zero and one. And this level are talking about, I have zero, one, two, three photon. Again, this is electromagnetic wave, so it is photon. Same as optical cavity, but just different wavelength. So I can have a state that the, have a zero Cooper pair and then have zero, one, two, three atoms like this, right? Uh, 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 photons. So I have zero photon or zero charge. Or I can have one Cooper pair, but zero, one, two, three photons. So I have zero photon and one charge. How do I know whether it is zero and one? And that is what I tried to tell you earlier. The state of the atom is going to change. You see this omega r minus g2 over delta change the level of exciting, of adding one photon to the system. If you have zero charge or a zero Cooper pair, the energy you need to excite or to include one photon to this uh, resonator is omega r minus g squared divided by delta. If you're, you have one Cooper pair, it is omega r plus g squared divided by delta. Now, uh, no need to memorize this, right, if you feel confusing, but I do want you to memorize that how it works. It is that the state of your qubit change the resonant frequency of the cavity. That's it. And because of this, the, the resonant frequency is changed. Now, if I apply a pulse to it, right? Apply a pulse to it, then it's going to have different peak when I measure it. And by doing this, I know whether it is in zero and one. So that completes the description uh, uh, of the, uh, how we measure a qubit in a superconducting hardware. Here show a simulation in this paper. So, what we, uh, but it's a good thing to show how it works. We actually measure at a center frequency. And because all these microwave pulse, they has real and imaginary parts because they have a face. So whether if you are at zero, you have a different, I mean, if your P 
peak frequency shift lower due to zero or shift higher due to one, you have a different real and imaginary part combination. So when you read it at this frequency, right, you will have different so-called IQ block. You have the, here show you the in-phase and out-of-phase quadrature, but it's just same as real and imaginary. So because of noise, you actually have some distribution. It's not always at the center point. So in quantum computing, what you want to do is to set up the device so the separation is large enough. And then I would say anything above this is one. Everything below this is zero. Again, what is below this, it means the real and imaginary part has this type of combination. And you see that some of the green comes to here because of the uh, noise. And this constitutes the fidelity of the readout. Okay, so we're almost done. We know how to do the, make the super, superconducting qubit. We know how to do the readout. Then how do I do a single qubit gate? Here is a uh, pretty complicated, no need to understand. But the main point I want you to get is, I show you the broad sphere earlier. For any single qubit, the state can be mapped to a broad sphere. So every state is on top of the sphere. So what is a quantum gate again? Is the rotation of the vector on the broad sphere for a single qubit, right? In its hyperspace. So basically, we can use something called Euler, Euler rotation to make it systematic. You can rotate it three times, first about the Z axis, and then about the y axis and then about the z axis for different angle. Then it corresponds to this matrix. You can ignore it. But this matrix is useful for us to construct a physical qubit, right? The all everything I want to tell you is that uh, a single qubit gate is the rotation of broad sphere. And we by getting the correct matrix, then we know the angle we need to rotate. Now I want to emphasize this rotation is not in our 3D space. We just map the hyperspace to our 3D space. But this rotation does have some meaning correspond to our 3D space because, for example, in a spin qubit, the 3D space, the, uh, the Z direction correspond to the magnetic field direction. But however, still, we are not rotating in the 3D space. Please remember this. So when we implement the superconducting qubit, it is like this. Uh, we will apply a gate pulse to here. Now, we can uh, construct the Hamiltonian, which I cannot show here. It's pretty long. Again, it's in the YouTube playlist. I showed you earlier, Concurrent Computing Architecture, we derive from scratch. You will find that no matter uh, it's Hamiltonian, right? That means the equation determine how it change can be expressed ex as this. And this is just like a spin case. It can be uh, model as night I have an effective magnetic field. This is just a mapping. It's not that we have the magnetic field in this system. Okay. But why do I want to show you this equation? I want to show a few things. First is that you will apply the gate pulse with some signal so that you change this NG, which is a part of the E. You see E is a function of the capacitive energy and also NG, which is the background charge. By changing this voltage, I'm going to change the charge here, right? just capacitive coupling, right? If you are an E student, that is easy for you to understand, capacitive cu coupling. So if I have a smooth pulse here, I'm going to change the uh, NG here with some small signal, right? Eventually, you find that this Hamiltonian is equal to this. Uh, the only thing I want to show you is that this is mapped to a spin qubit. So in a spin qubit, I think you all kind of understand a spin under magnetic field, it will precess, it will rotate about the magnetic field, right? I map this to here, it is the same. It's going to precess and rotate about this broad sphere so that I can uh, get any arbitrary one qubit quantum state and I can move that uh, quantum gate and I can move it to any place, right? But I want to show you, you see, delta depends on Josephson's energy, capacitive energy that we mentioned earlier. This omega depends on eta, 
which depends on the gain voltage you apply. It also depends on the phase, which is very important. It depends on the phase of your driving pulse. So you see that quantum computing is very uh, delicate. It has a you know, very good control on the pulse that you are sending to the qubit, including its phase, not just its noise from other sources, its frequency, right? And that's why earlier I showed you that people like quantum machines, they just sold this system for a lot of money because they have a lot of FPGA and algorithm and interface to make this easy, okay? So there is single qubit gate. For example, here we can apply the uh, X and Hadamard gate, and then we can let it oscillate from zero to one, zero to one, right? Finally, I will talk about the two qubit gates. Uh, we won't, I cannot go too, too deep, but basically, for example, uh, we talk about C0 gate, right? But it's not just C0 gate that is useful. You can also use I swap gate. This is the I swap gate. And in, for this gate, it has, it is also an entanglement gate. So if you, you can transform the C0 gate or other operation to using I swap gate. For different uh, quantum computing architecture, you will see people use different entanglement gates because of the physics. We are using the physics to implement it. For example, in a spin qubit case, they actually use the control phase shift gate instead of I swap gate or instead of C, C not gate because it's easier to implement due to physics. In this case, I have two qubits, of course, because it's two qubit gates. And what they're doing is rely on this coupling of this capacitor. So a hand waving understanding given by this uh, paper is that you can be 0, 0, 1, 1, right? Again, what is 0, 0, 1, 1? It's related to the energy. They have different energy. So if they, they are both at 0, 0, 1, 1, just like a classical circuit, they are not going to exchange energy. So the state is not going to oscillate between them. But if one of them is 0, 1 is 1, then they will start oscillating, right? And this, is, this can be seen from this matrix. The first one is correspond to zero, zero. The last is one, one, right? If you understand the matrix well, but otherwise this is okay. You with this type of oscillation, you just do the time correctly. You want to turn on them so that you change their coupling and also energy difference. It's not shown here, full and other circuit. This oscillation, and then you do the right timing, you can make this to zero. When this is go pi over two, this is zero, and this is equal to one. Right? So again, a very precise control is important. And I guess you will understand why there's so much error, not just the noise, but also the control. Okay, so that's almost the last slide, right? So I try to cover from the basic algorithm all the way to the hardware. I hope you have some idea of what quantum computing is about. I want to say, you see that we are with 100 qubit, 300 qubit, I get a lot of information, but unfortunately, it's in the qubit. I cannot get A0 all the way to A to the power N minus one. Then what should we do? We need to use constructive and destructive interference or some smart algorithm that use this interference so that it tell us the answer that we want. For example, in the function balance question or in Schwartz algorithm, the period of finding the function. We use this to solve some very difficult problem in classical uh, computing, okay? Quantum computer cannot replace classical computer because they cannot do 100 plus 100 well. You spend a lot of, uh, yeah, you just cannot, right? Based on what we discussed. But it's a very powerful accelerator, right? So I think you can see high-speed classical computer plus quantum computer, maybe plus chat GPT, will really revolutionize the world in the future, okay? Finally, if you're interested to continue to study, my experience is that you just nearly go through the math and accept them, okay? Uh, do not think too, mu too much philosophically, right? Uh, that's uh, what uh, it was said here in this paper. And finally, again, uh, the advertisement uh, uh, for my book and my YouTube video, uh, you, you,
you, you will see a lot of information there. Okay, 